Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Oh, so I'm gonna, I, I just hit record, but I'm still laughing from that previous conversation. Yeah, so, cool. which is fine. We're going to roll right into it. I'm here with Mike Molinay, who is the co-founder and COO of Branch. So Mike actually wrote this awesome article for a company, I think that you're advising or, or, or whatnot, which we'll get into, which, and if anybody has, has done themselves a disservice and actually listened to more than one of these podcasts, they know that I say I like to be proven wrong every once in a while, because it proves that this is why we talk, we learn things from things, right? And so I have been on a war path for years about Slack usage in the CS world. And I was reading Mike's article and I was like, no, this all makes sense, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm so wrong about this. So I'm gonna link out to the article so everybody can read it and pull it up while they're listening or whatnot. But before we do that, Mike, talk a little bit about what you're doing at Branch and and uh, and then we can get into this this really cool stuff that uh, all around Slack and using Slack to improve retention, so. Yeah, perfect. Well, first of all, Jeff, thanks for having me on. Oh, Excited right. to hopefully persuade you that Slack can be a really powerful tool. You got me, I swear to God, I, I was inside <laughs> a, I was doing a customer journey today and there was a specific part post launch where it says shut down slack and i removed that box as part of the process uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I talk to a lot of csms on a regular basis at various companies and i think that it's becoming more and more popular but yeah let me introduce myself so i'm mike i am co-founder of branch branch is a mobile linking platform and mobile measurement platform for mobile apps basically yep. so we're a technology that goes into apps like basically large apps like Uber and Spotify to help them work better and link better. Yep. Uh, and we are based in Palo Alto, California. We're about 550 employees. We have a few thousand customers, including call it maybe like 500 yep. enterprise customers of which about 300 or so. so yeah. yeah, no, so so <laughs> we, we service some of our largest and healthiest accounts on Slack. We've been actually heavy Slack users from the beginning ever since 2014. Uh, yep. And we were do using Slack for customers before things like share channels and Slack Connect even existed. So oh, going back even to okay. 2015, 2016, yep. we would invite as guests, people at a customer or even a prospect to our Slack workspace, yep. or sometimes we'd go join their workspace. And then we, at one point we had something like 3000 guests in our Slack instance. Wow. We had so many people that were in these channels and then. Slack rolled out shared channels beta and we got into the beta. We were one of the first people using it and we've, we've loved it ever since we've seen a lot of value from it. So yep, definitely yep. a different, different way of engaging with customers, which we'll talk about a little bit. Today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so in my, I love using Slack and I, I've been using a tool like that. I mean, I'm talking like aim pop-up back in the day, like, uh, like, so I definitely know the power, but I've really just kept it for projects and implementation specific. And I think we were talking a little bit before we got on, I tell salespeople that, yeah, sign that deal. We're going to get connected to you on Slack. We're going to have a kickoff call. We're going to go. And, and it definitely builds that engagement, but I typically have then said, okay, post implementation, like shut it down. Like, and cause the, the classic joke that I always say is that Slack's great for CS if you like working nights and weekends, but so I'd love to hear some of these early success stories and how they kind of then folded into 
this sort of slack as a strategy for retention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the benefits that you see during onboarding and implementation are the benefits that do extend to the various different life cycle stages of the customer. So a lot of those benefits that people, when they use Slack with customers, will tend to see are that the Slack, the customer is much more, you have direct access to them. You can even get responses from them much more quickly, usually, because, you know, during a sales process, even during an implementation and even during regular success stage, you still want to engage with and get responses from yeah. your customer. And I've been saying and touting for the last couple of years that our customers are working in Slack. We need to meet our customers where they are. And that philosophy of don't make them go somewhere else if they don't want to work somewhere else right. has kind of been something that we've seen really resonate and has, has pro provided a lot of benefit. So the benefits that really tie from the same thing that you might see in, in the implementation phase are that they're much more engaged. You can get it, them much more engaged. You have faster turnarounds, faster responses, mm -hmm. which I think is important when you're interacting with customers. I think we all see kind of that, that flow where you might be in something, you might have an issue or a question or need a response, you ask it, but if you don't get a response in you know a short time, yeah. then you move on to something else. And sometimes getting that person back to that workflow of, maybe implementing your SDK in our cases, or yeah. you know, rolling out their first campaign or whatever it is that you're trying to get them to do. If they've moved on and we're all very busy, constant distractions, lots to do, it's hard to get them back to that, that place. So if you can have more response, a faster response and actually answer what they're trying to do in real time, yeah. you can help enable them to actually ultimately do the thing that you want them to do, which is roll out your product, use your product, and yeah. grow so that then you can upsell and cross that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, I, I'm just seeing TTV just going down and down and down and just being able to, to do that. I, one note on that is that I've typically tried to push decision-making into like a tool. I mean, I used to do this back mm -hmm. in the base camp days and everything, and especially with Slack, first of all, usually after like 30 days, everything's gone and stuff like that. But if it's a decision, like I'm trying to think of an easy one, but like, hey, should we enable this configuration setting on this property or something like that? I typically will try and get that. So uh, most of my customers use like a tool like Baton or Rocket Lane or whatever, because, and then there you've got a variety of tasks. And then you can, in that task say, do we have a decision on this? And then it'll be documented mm. there because I've just lived the life of people like, who said that we should be enabling that property on this? And then you're like, wait, was it an email or a Slack? So I do drive like, decision making towards that but i do like the conversational aspect on i'm not sure if you have a perspective on on that based on i don't have a strong perspective on the decision making piece i think every company uses a different tool or tracks it in different yeah. ways what i have started to see is especially with savvy companies or fast moving companies they will come up with some sort of schema that they'll use in slack there's one very large company that we work with that they're very good at it and they have certain schemas so you know sometimes they'll start a if it's a request or a question, they'll start with request or question. If it's a decision, they'll start with decision or yeah. topic or discussion. And so they start the message with that. And then usually the conversation. I like that. So right. it's like they have their own like Slack what, ontology. I'm trying to think of like the correct. Exactly. Term. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like a Slack ontology. And actually we've started doing that more at branch based on what we learned from this customer. And we, with this customer, we don't just have one shared channel. We actually have at least four, I think it's five shared channels with them because they're big enough that they have different teams interacting with our different teams in a different way. So there's a centralized channel and a different channel. But we learned that from them, having that ontology. It, I think it, it can be pretty effective if that works for you. But if not, then you can take that and you can actually put it somewhere else as well. But the nice thing about Slack is that it is a searchable log. And I think that's the acronym, right? Searchable log of oh, yeah, conversation excellent. and knowledge, right? Yeah. And so it's a searchable log. And so somebody that maybe comes into the conversation six months later or a year later, they can go back and search if they're looking for something. What was that thing we decided? And if you marked it as with your ontology decision. Oh, that's a great um, way to get around Then you can that. actually okay. find that thing. Yeah. yeah. Do you have bots driven off of that as well? Like uh, you see the decision coming in. Well, I put bots to maybe discuss this a little earlier, but we can get into it now. But like, because what I've seen those things as being effective is being like, oh, you know, a question was asked. Do you want to drive them to Zendesk or something like mm -hmm. that? Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what Thena does. And Thena's the oh, company yeah. that uh, right. I was I was the guest guest blog post on. So we use them, and that's the primary one that we use. And we can talk about that a little bit later yeah. in terms of how they do that. But you know, in terms of detecting requests and things like that, and pushing it to other places, whether it be you know Salesforce, whether it be yep. Gainsight, or 
Zendesk or anything like that. So there's a lot of a lot of power that you can do there. And I think that's what we're starting to see, right? And that was that was part of what I've been pushing at branch and part of actually why the FEMA guys are building what they're building, which is if you meet your customers where they work and you they're in Slack and you're also in Slack, that's that's really amazing, right? But it does create challenges, it creates challenges around we can talk about rules of engagement later in terms of the volume, but it also mm -hmm. creates challenges around how does this connect with the other thing? Because you don't want to go into other dashboards all the time. Right. And so you have to be smart about the way in which those things are utilized and how they're connected with other things, which is where Athena ends up coming and connecting to the other places. So you can stay where you work, the customer can stay where they work, um, but you don't need to worry about going through a different dashboards. Because I think we're, we all are starting to suffer with the rise of SaaS applications from dashboard fatigue. You don't need yep. yet another dashboard necessarily to check. Correct. And so if you can do a lot of these things, track requests, manage alerts, submit tickets, do marketing automation, and do it within the place that you already are, Slack, it can be really powerful. And I think that's what we're starting to see, the rise of Slack being that kind of central place where work actually happens, yep. and email kind of degrading over time as a place where, you know, that's where your marketing newsletters and junk mail goes and maybe the, uh, you know, the occasional spam message that didn't get filtered out. And then maybe 10% work related messaging is, is what I'm seeing in, in when I've, as, as I've looked through kind of my email inbox and see how, what volume is actually business related versus yeah. other stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about some of those rules of engagement, specifically, let's say implementation, like I, I don't like to have too many rules of engagement in there. It's like, you want that TTV, you, you know, you, it's okay if people are slacking back and forth on a variety of different things. But let's say customers gone live, and that's where I typically pull the plug out before. How do you make sure that the CSM isn't just buried in losing track of things and responding at late points of the night and the weekend and things like that? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of different things that you can do. I think first and foremost, setting the expectations with the customer and then repeating those as needed on an ongoing basis. So our CSMs have done a really effective job at being able to say, okay, this is how we're going to use the channel. This is what, you know, how you should submit certain requests. And I think that can be really effective at the point in time in which you remind people. Yeah. Um, but you also have to kind of keep people updated. One of the things that I'm working with Dina on, on their product development roadmap is being able to say when a new person joins a channel, because constantly people are getting added to channels, post a welcome message. And in that welcome message automated just for that person, tell them, here's a summary of what the company or the Slack channel is about. Here's a summary of how you use the Slack channel. Here's some rules and engagements. Oh, and by the way, here's some suggested links. And then also Slack has this new bookmark function. I don't know if you've noticed it, but at oh. the top, in addition to, used to just be able to it do be pins. pins. Yeah. But now you can do book bookmarks. Those bookmarks link to things like internal documentation, internal documentation, whatever. And so having a set of five different bookmarks up there visible with emojis, I've seen to be really effective where one might be, you know, your CSM, and then it's a link to the, you know, it's just the person's name. One might be playbook, one might be, you know, submit a, submit a ticket. You can do all sorts of things. And if you put five of the most commonly used things up there in bookmarks, that can also be really effective. But That's going awesome. back to the rules of engagement, yeah, 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 it's really- I do not know that. I should also now say, not, neither of us work for Slack. <laughs> we just- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just Slack power users. And so, so, Going back to the rules of engagement, first and foremost is updating the customer and then I, as much as possible, letting them know or reminding them and the more you can automate that, whether it's something like Thena or something else, you're able to keep people as they get added to the channel updated. But you still have to remind people and so sometimes you have to tell them real time, hey, this seems like more of uh, a request, I'm going to create it into a ticket and you can mm -hmm. do that with something like Thena to turn into an actual ticket, have it sent to Zendesk or whatever you might use. So if that's the case, because then we don't have to, because I have a situation with a customer where it's like, it's like a, I'm using a stick and carrot approach, which is like, oh, we might have to take away Slack if you don't start mm -hmm. using Zendesk for your support tickets, but this would take kind of take care of that problem because it would just kind of auto, I'm viewing Thena and again, just not trying, it's all new to me, but uh, it sounds like they're almost like a Zapier for Zap Slack as much. So like it's connecting tools together to, to do proper business workflows and things like that. Yeah. And helping manage your customers inside of Slack and, yeah. and even prospects too. Right. But yeah, the, I, I think you have to look at the incentive, right? Like why yeah. isn't somebody doing that thing that you want them to, if you have to keep reminding them, Hey, go to this help portal or yeah. 
go to your email and send the email to support at, yeah. but they're not doing it on a recurring basis. That's because they're not incentivized. And you can use the stick approach, but using sticks with customers isn't necessarily always the it's best not, approach. Yeah, it's so, not the best. <laughs> so it's more about how can you make their lives easier rather than trying to make your life easier? Because I think if you can make their life easier and have something that makes your life easier in the meantime, or in the, at the same time, then that's, that's beautiful, right? That's a win-win. Yeah. So I'm a big believer of why, like understanding the incentives and why the customer might be doing something or not doing something that you want and then figuring out how can you make it easier for them to ultimately get what they want without, disrupt, with, without disrupting your yeah. workflow yeah. as well. And that's where I think some of these tools can, can really, really come in. Oh, I Speaking also wanted of, to clarify that the, the stick approach is for the CSM is not for the customer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, I, I don't okay. really do the stick approach for customers, but for CSMs, okay. it's kind of like, hey, listen, like, you know, but... No, I appreciate that. That's a good distinction. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the changes that we made too, because we, we had a period where we would, during the implementation phase, similarly, we were worried about the rules of engagement and we we're worried about the customer who's going to, you know, maybe abuse having a Slack channel and having that direct access, which is always a concern. And so I remember one time we had a new customer, we onboarded them over 60 days. They had 115 employees in our Slack channel. Oh my God. And we closed and we closed it. After yep. the input, it was like, cool, you're live. Congratulations, close Slack channel. And my reaction was, wow, this is like a heavily engaged customer, constant conversation all day long, large name brand. And they have 115 people in our Slack it's just channel. Just chatting about your product. Like, what an amazing <laughs> channel to have, right? And, yep. and as soon as you shut that down, where does it all go? All those people get kicked out. Yep. They no longer have access. And then also now everything's being done on email, but it's de being done in more silos. So instead of 115 people seeing that, you might have five people seeing the conversation going back and forth. But that's it. And people tend to forget. And I think being top of mind for customers on a regular basis is one of the most important things. Because if you're, if you, if they know and see and hear, there's that psychological bias of, just remembering, oh yeah, branch. Oh, we use branch really heavily. For example, would you right? would you go so far as to say that that's a community? I, I, uh, I mean, frankly, I think I so. Think so. It's, it's a it's it's a it's a small community. It's a narrow community, but yeah, it's absolutely. But, but let's let's take that another. You know, I hundred percent agree. I think it's a uh, leading the witness here, but I think it's a community, and 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 you would need to roll out a different tool. Here's our community tool. Please go there. These are all the things that, as I said, made me sit around and question life decisions for a while because I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> why was I doing this? I was really trying to protect CSMs, but this is like, you've created a community, Organic, yeah. organically created a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And, and, I, and you see the, the immense benefits that come from that, right? And the, the benefits that I see, and I, I'm a big believer that your existing revenue is five times more valuable than, than a new dollar of revenue because it's cheaper to to service and maintain those people become your references and referral oh, those absolutely. people move to new companies and bring you with them and so if you give them a really good experience that it's not only that existing revenue which is much more profitable than your oh. first year of revenue but it's also that they then bring you and actually when you look at the number of new business deals that come in and where those leads are coming from a vast majority of them Just to use this are, stuff over there yeah. They're inbound. They, it's like, oh, I used to use it over there. It was amazing. We had so if you deliver that amazing experience, it has effects all the way back to pre-sales and not to mention upsells and cross-sells with that existing customer. Yeah. And so that's why I believe that delighting delivering an amazing customer experience, but doing it efficiently and effectively is critically important and doing it in a way that the customer likes and is used to working rather than trying to force them into some something else. I was reading another uh post or it was a study recently and it was talking about you know customer success, uh, customer happiness and satisfaction and renewal yep. rates and all that sort of stuff and the vast majority of customers that churn basically they have an issue where they're unsatisfied but they're not actually submitting either feedback or requests they're just kind of living silently in that pain yeah until they churn like a and bad so marriage Sorry. like a bad marriage and you don't realize that it's, you might think like, okay, anger. Quiet, absolutely yeah yeah, and it's the problem is churn is very much a lagging indicator. It's the, yeah. the lag, like the the most laggy of lagging indicators, because by the time it happens, there's nothing you can do. Right, and, and, and but and we we've seen those examples. I think we talked about it last time of of people going in pitching a big upsell, like oh we're gonna you know, and next thing you know they're like <laughs> actually we've replaced you. You're like oh yeah. my god, <laughs> wow! Yeah. Talking about a lagging and, indicator. Yeah, and that's where that. 
that's where I think delightful and amazing customer experience is good, but also making it easy for them to engage. Because if there's a friction point, if they're like, oh, I like in Slack, but they killed the Slack channel, I have to send them an email if I have an issue, ah, whatever, I'll just kind of live with the pain. But if you make it easy, then you can you can get those signals. And those signals can be positive, they can be negative, but it doesn't matter because those are leading indicators on the health and, and sentiment of that account. And so you can use that as ways to detect, oh, there's a something here. For example, you might see an increase in messages or you might see a decrease in messages happening in Slack. Those leading indicators can ultimately inform whether or not, oh, there might be an issue here, right? And that's one of the things that being on, on their analytics side, we're starting to test as well, is being able to say, oh, the requests and conversations are actually going down over time. And then you can go, look, is that good? Is that bad? It might be good. It might be because they're happy and they're actually using the product well. Yeah. Or it might be because they're disengaging. One of the other things that I've yeah. kind of kept an eye on too is are people starting to leave the Slack channel on an increased frequency, right? Because if you have 50 customer users in there and you're starting to see people drop off, that might be a sign that they're, you know, maybe disengaging. And that disengagement is also a leading indicator. So you can start to pick up yeah. all these are, are sort you, of signals. Are you pulling in that all into like data ops and somebody's analyzing that aspect? Yeah. No, we're we're not pulling it into any other system other than right now it's yeah. you know subjective and keeping keeping a manual eye on it. But even that at that rate, you're still able to do it. I'm you know, I'm in hundreds of customer channels and I'm able yeah. to kind of start to see some of that sentiment. And that's where Athena also is starting to automate some of that. Like, hey, we're detecting increased droppage, increased people leaving, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So there's more things again that you can start to automate these things rather rather than having to rely on on the manual aspect of it. But they can be really powerful in detecting these things in like sentiments as before suddenly something before your customer turns. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on the positive side, things like upsells and cross sales, if they're more highly engaged and they use your product better, they're probably you're probably going to lead maybe to a volume upsell, right? They're going to be more successful with your product, but also that's when you can start to see cross sales, product cross sales, and you can see people say, "Hey, you know, I'm seeing you're using it in this way. We have this product line that might be applicable for you." Or you can start sending marketing messages when you release a new product. This is something that we did recently. We released a new paid product, sent a message to all of our Slack channels. The response there was amazing because people can re they can engage. They can say, "Oh, this is interesting, Mike." Can I learn more about this, Mike? Can we set up a demo versus like the email marketing that tends to happen a lot of times? It's first of all, it goes to fewer people, but you yep. send an email marketing and there's not really much they can do, right? You might have a CTA. It's, a, it's, like, it's, a, it's like a broadcast. Yeah, it's, an, it's, like, yeah, it's a broadcast. Here's, here's a newspaper. Go read it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, okay, click here to read the blog post. And you're like, okay, that sounds good. But you're not having an active conversation. It's very asynchronous. Yeah. And that's not a good way to kind of get people when they're interested in that moment. Again, that short attention span of you've got them for 10 seconds, for five minutes, whatever it is. Yeah. Can you capture them then? Because if not, they've moved on to something oh, else. Oh, that's right. It's like, the, it. it's like the it's like the drift model, right? Like um, you're on the website, boom, like talk to somebody, right? Like exactly. Yeah. What's well, actually, yeah. since you brought up email marketing, you know, more it, Big year of learning 2022. I learned that customers probably right around your size, maybe right around that 500 level series C, I'm not sure what you're at in terms of that, but like I have now seen customer marketing report to the CCO, which I love if you do it right. Actually, we did something similar at Virgin back in the day when we, uh, so we basically needed it's kind of like a B2C, B2C type of play where you you sign on a company and then you need to get their users engaged. So who's better to get the users engaged? Not regular marketing, customer marketing, which comes out of the, you know, because you're trying to drive those value conversations and everything. So I, I've definitely seen a customer marketing organization or, or you know, group reporting to the CCO. So I, I'm I'm seeing some you know very dim light bulb going off above my head about tying in this customer marketing and the Slack messaging going out about things like that and then you met and you had mentioned started mentioning some of that so I'd love to go down that road a little bit. Yeah, I love the concept of customer marketing reporting into a CCO. I, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where yeah. somebody reports as long as you it's have happened. the right kind of incentives and yeah. reporting, et cetera. But I love that because what it really does is it aligns the CCO saying, I, they want ultimate success of their customers and their department, and they can make sure that the marketing that's going out to their customers is well aligned with that. So at Branch, with basically customer success and sales rolling up through me, one of the things that we started doing was sending out marketing newsletters in our Slack channels, customer shared Slack channels. And yep. so, and originally I, I built this 
complex script to be able to do it. And it's, it was very, very heavy weight. You know, it took a couple hours to do every time. We're trying to send them every two weeks. Yep. This is something where Athena's built marketing automation to be able to do this. But let me just kind of explain the purpose and the reason why yep. I saw so much value from it and why I, you know, spent a weekend trying to build this to be able to get it done. Um, going back to email, email marketing yep. newsletters, we, and we've spent 30 years, 20 years getting email marketing newsletter. Everyone is bombarded with them. You have to send email marketing newsletters, but there's a lot of people that don't open them. They put them on, you know, spam or digest, or they hide them, they auto folder them, whatever. And also you have to be signed up for an email newsletter. And I did a, a check with one of our channels and I looked at the customer and I said, how many of the customers users are signed up for our email newsletter? It was like 20. Yeah. How many customer users are in our shared Slack channel? It was like 200. It was 10 wow. X the number of people. And so we, when we send a Slack, marketing newsletter and this could be a product update it could be events that are coming up it could be content that was released recently blog post whatever right when we send these all 200 of those people are seeing that because in the shared slack channel they're opening that Slack slack channel because there's a notification nobody yeah. wants notifications and they're seeing it now how heavily they engage might vary but they're seeing it and seeing that content having much broader visibility can be really amazing one of the things that working on is being able to actually segment it right because if you have events coming up in north america you don't want to send that necessarily to all of your european customers or your apac customers and so being able to segment that that's kind of an advanced feature but the beauty of that is you get much broader visibility it's more of a conversation it's easier to act on and you can make it so basically your csms don't need to do anything or they can you know segment it so it goes beyond even marketing newsletters right because you can start doing things like oh, here's a blog post that we just released, right? And what typically happens is you say, hey, CSM, can you share this with your customers? And they're yeah. like, oh, I'm going to put this in email. Yeah, and we fire up Marketo. And fire up Marketo. <laughs> and now instead you can basically say, okay, cool. I'm going to send this to all of my customers and it's going to come across as a message and it's going to look really good. And it's interesting because the I'm... most engaged users are the ones that are in the Slack channel. So it's like, oh, well, we've got three champions. Okay. But yeah, but then you've got all these other users that are in there. Yeah. yeah that's great. Yeah. And I think kind of going, talking about that real briefly in terms of all the users that are in there, I think what I've found is each team in each department is operating their own applications right on the vendor side so on like on our side sales is operating in salesforce cs is operating in gainsight yeah. engineering and product they're operating in other tools our billing team is operating in another tool our renewals team is operating in another tool right everybody's in their own tools but slack is a centralized place in the common software where everyone is and yeah. so suddenly when you have an entire account team you have the csm the solutions engineer, the AE, the AE's manager, maybe the renewals person, all in that shared Slack channel. Everyone has common context. Everyone has increased visibility. Everyone can see all of that and interact with the customer in different ways. So when the customer has a question or an issue or a request and your people can jump on it based on who it is and what the request is for, that's amazing versus everyone kind of being do, their do you separate have tools. Internal Slack channels versus external? Yeah, we do. We have both. Yeah. So basically with the customer, we'll have, you know, external branch and the customer name, and then internally we'll have an internal channel. And we sometimes we'll coordinate on that internal channel. Sometimes we'll coordinate on the external channel within a thread. Uh, yeah. if the customer has a request. And so we'll do both. And, and it's really amazing because then you put notes as well and you get those increased visibility notes versus before what would happen in AE or CSM, go into Salesforce, type up their notes for the week or after a meeting. Who's seeing that? No one, right? And now instead you have a CSM types up the notes from a really good meeting. They put it in there. Everyone has visibility. And then the AE says, oh, that's an opportunity to, to cross sell this product. Let's connect on that. Yeah. And so that increased visibility and bringing everyone together in the tool where everyone is, that common platform, that common communication yeah. platform versus everyone putting all their information in siloed platforms that nobody else has access to. Like that, really like powerful. That Salesforce, what's their chat feature name? I even forgot. Oh my God. Yeah. Is, yeah. I can't remember. You know which, what? Which I no one. Yes, I do. Yeah. And, and at Branch, at least, no one really uses it. Um, you actually, you said the word thread, which just triggered something off to me. A lot of this for me doesn't work unless people know how to use threads, right? Or else it's yeah. just mess, right? Like, do you do any education like, Please respond in thread. I have seen people. I, I, it's a little heavy-handed sometimes, but like, please respond <laughs> in threads, or else, yeah, I get lost very easily and stuff. 
we don't we don't do any of that but what we try to do is try we try to model the behavior that we hope and expect others yeah. to use and uh that's where i think if you can model the behavior in certain ways you know subject for example one of the things that we do with some of our customers is with the beginning of the thread it's just subject in brackets with bold and then the actual context of the thread or of the that conversation starts in that first comment of the thread yeah. uh, and that can be really effective at, at making sure that then people know okay i need to use the thread for this it doesn't always work not everyone necessarily is a heavy slack user or necessarily likes threads but i think people are starting to use it more and more remember slack didn't have threads in the beginning so some people yeah. are conditioned to not yeah. using threads because that's just the way they worked originally but now i think with slack threads being more and more used it's becoming less and less of a problem so we just try to model the behavior that we're looking for got it that's awesome. And of course, you got to enable Giphy because everybody needs to put their. Uh... Of course, yeah. The more gifts, the better. <laughs> what did I miss yeah, and... here? This is this is amazing stuff. You know, we've got community, we've got upsell marketing, just general day in and day out operations support. I'm trying to think. We've yeah, I, I think there's just a couple things like yeah. the if you don't want if you don't want people to engage in certain things like after your implementation, you can take your implementation or pro serve team out of that channel. Got it makes it. a very yeah. clear signal. Yep. They're gone. Don't go right? back and you talk need to anything. people they're over here. Yep. Yes. Yep. And then when they ask questions like, oh, what happened to, you know, Mike? And you say, oh, well, he's on the pro serve team. Your, your services contract ended. Now you're operating with me, your customer success manager and your solutions engineer. That's the first thing. So don't be afraid to get people out yep. where people can leave on their own. I think that can be really good and actually really healthy because it does train well, customer. also just on that note, I, I use, oh, I don't want to say sticks and carrots, but like I use, sorry, milestones like that a lot so that it's very clear to people like you are live now, two week burn in. Congratulations. We are now at the point, say bye to Mike. This is your CSM. And it's just very clear to everybody. And it just shifts to a different sort of, you know, you know, because before you go live, there's, are you going to go live? When are you going to flip the yeah. switch? And there's a leverage thing and all these other little things where now it's just very clear who does what, what part of the customer journey are we in now as well? So, yeah. Yeah. One of the other carrots that, that we use as well, and I was chatting with the CSM earlier today from a large public SaaS company that they use this as well is, you know, they might have Slack channels for customers above 50,000 ARR or, you know, a hundred thousand, but somebody at a lower tier can get access to a Slack channel via a pro serve engagement, right? So they, they can charge. So this is also a revenue generating opportunity where it's like, oh, you want direct access to us? Oh, okay, you can get that Let's do a pro oh, serve. Nice. It's almost like a support gold level or something like that. Exactly, it's a yeah. different level of support. And the, the, and the way I kind of equate it is, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, support was done maybe in different methods, right? A lot of phone support, yep. et cetera. And then email came along and beginning email was like, oh, I don't want my, people email, I don't want my customers email, and then email became the centralized piece. And now what we're seeing is this shift where everyone's already in Slack, everyone just wants to be supported in Slack, they don't want to have to go to a different tool, which a lot of people aren't even using very much of anymore to do a request, they want that more real time. And so if you can meet them there and provide that really amazing experience, I think there's a lot of upside and benefits to it. And so we've talked everything about kind of the post sales side, right? Close yep. a contract, implementation, onboarding, customer success, maybe upsells and cross sells. Yep. Now what we're starting to see is actually, and we're starting to use this as well, starting to bring Slack into the picture before the sale, before the contract flows. And so even on the pre-sales process yeah. where let's say a company Are you doing POC are you doing POCs as well? You, yeah, yeah, that's POCs, a great time to start doing the Slack. Very because in POCs, what do you want? You want, you know, fast. Uh, time to value time to first yeah, value low, time to first value absolutely yeah first value slow like low friction just quick responses high engagement and slack is the best way to do that right so you can do that with the poc they can see value. you can go back and forth you can learn about problems more easily rather than it being isolated in the silo and requests or, or like only on certain problems like on a weekly phone call or something like that and so it can be much more effective on the poc side and even before that Somebody reaches out and you're like, okay, yeah, let, no problem. Let's engage. Let's coordinate on Slack. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a shared channel link. Click on that. We'll be connected, and then we can coordinate a call, do a demo. I can loop in other folks if you have questions, yeah. and you can start to do that on the pre-sales side as well to enable kind of faster sales cycles versus before what it was was email, right? And then it's like, okay, oh, it's and it's also you can track level engage track level engagement almost like where you're tracking like what tracking email opens right it's like yeah your, yep. your deal signals will go up because yeah these people are just firing away you know people's it's hard to get people's attention so if they're asking questions in slack you've got their attention so 
that's the other interesting thing. And this is, this is another thing that you know, helps with actually not to sell them too hard, but basically you see in your CRM, all of your emails and your meetings. But what you miss is actually where in some cases, 80% of the work is actually happening, which is yeah. Slack. And so with something like, you know, you can start to track, okay, how many conversations happened, et cetera. And you can see what's that level of engagement. Cause I think the, that type of information and those indicators could be really powerful on the, on the CS side, but also on the, on the sales side, because we use a lot of those indicators to determine deal health. And when we go through our pipeline review on a weekly basis, we'll look, okay, when was the last time we engaged with this person? And if you're engaging with them on Slack, but you're not on email, you know, you might miss it. You might think this is red or it's dead. Yeah. And instead, actually, they're highly engaged. They're just engaged on a very high engagement, but disconnected yeah. platform like Slack. You just made me, I apologize. This is totally off script and everything, but like, um, this is, I'm, I'm now very curious. Um, a, do you run a standard like QBR process? And what is, how, how is your level of engagement on things like, like, it doesn't have to be percentage based, but like going well, like definitely seeing an improvement or things like that. Um, because I yeah, feel definitely. like everybody struggles, you know, there's a big QBR question this year, like what should we be doing? But you're consider, oh, <laughs> go listen to the Bob London one. Uh, but uh, I, I've got, I think we discussed our own opinions on that, but back on track here, the whole thing is about providing value all the time right and and actionable stuff and when it happens and not waiting till this you know event to be able to start saying like hey here's a chart in x y and z so i i feel that i'm not a sure if you need them or if you do they might be a lot better just because people are just very so engaged with your product and everything yeah yeah you definitely definitely can be I, I, it's it's a bit of correlation, not necessarily causation, but basically yeah. the companies that are most engaged in Slack for the most part tend to also be the healthiest and tend to be the ones that upsell and cross sell yeah. the most, right? Yeah. Like I, I look at some of these companies that are just highly engaged. I'm like, man, they, I, I want to replicate this yeah. across the 300 Slack channels that we have. Again, that's where the problem comes in yeah. um, in terms of how do you scale that? And that's what the, like the FINA guys are doing in terms of helping scale that and making things automated and making things easier so CSM isn't bombarded with so many messages. Right. Yeah. But the but it, that is a challenge, right? How do you scale that? But if you can scale that effectively and, and efficiently, then I think you can get start to get some of these high engagement benefits in growth and NRR increase to a much broader set of customers beyond just the ones that you're highly servicing in that yeah. smaller number of channels. And going back to QBRs, yeah, QBRs, some, one of my favorites, I had a saying at Branch, <laughs> I think it was 2022 is the year of the QBR because I just wanted a lot more QBRs and we've yeah. been pushing really hard. And I think what we've, what we've iterated on is for the really large companies, yeah, QBRs, do them um, quarterly basis. Yeah. Then you can do semi-annual or annual for the, as you go down in the tiers, yeah. uh, which is, I think for like pretty standard practice. Yeah. But when you can engage with people more, then I think you can start to get some of those touch points. So it's not like uh, people know nothing about branch and then they come in and they hear about it once every six months. Rather, they're kind of up to date on most things, but that allows you to do or what I've seen and allow you to do. You're able to go much deeper on the on the QBR, where if you don't need to form that base level or go yeah. as deep on the base level of assumptions and knowledge and context, and everyone already has that, and then you're able to go deeper into level two or level three conversations, you get a lot more out of those rather than it just being a surface level. Here are your metrics. Talk about that for an hour. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's probably a good place to I know we could talk about this for hours. I told you to try and keep the time on, on these for the, everybody's morning walks and, and jogs and everything. On that note, I always like to end with something. If you, as you can, it's dark out. You can see it's almost pitch black here at four o'clock in the afternoon here in Boston. What is your, as we move into the winter, what's your big winter project or thing that you're doing for fun? Oh man, what, what am I doing for fun? This used to be my, my pandemic question. Like, are you baking bread? Are you learning guitar? Like, what? <laughs> well, I got in, I got into a road cycling last year in 2021 oh, nice. because in 2020 I ate way too much food and put on some pounds. So I, I decided I had to lose it, and then I, I bought a gravel bike, and so just got oh, it nice. got got it fixed yesterday. And so I think I'm going to be heading out on some some gravel rides in the cold awesome. weather, which will be a lot of fun. Oh, well, that's awesome! That's great. Well, listen, always a pleasure. Just hold on for a second. We'll do some wrap up, but. Uh... This was fascinating. I hope everybody else found it fascinating too, because it's not the usual ground that's covered. And uh, I think it's almost on the revolutionary side, but this, this will be 
the way things are being done in, in a few, in a year or two or something like that. So I, I think that's right on. I think it's the future. Absolutely. So uh, hold on one second and thanks so much. And uh, let's hit pause here.